couple of evenings ago, and we passed a, <clears throat> a sign that said, uh, it, was a, it was a church sign, is what it was, and the church sign, they, uh, they were going to do something for the single mothers, and what they were going to do, they had, a, they had a sign up and it said, oil change for single mothers, free oil change for single mothers. And I, I told Gene, I was like, that is just really neat. I like that idea of doing a single, uh, doing an oil change, a free oil change for single mothers. And I thought, what a, what a neat little, little outreach and a, a neat evangelistic kind of thing to do. And I just, I got to doing some math on that. And, uh, you know, around here, you know, we have an explosion of, uh, of, of these kind. Of, this would be, it could be expensive. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're pushing 20 bucks a vehicle, right, at best, even if you go and do your best to get the oil. And, and I mean, around here, I, I told Gina, I said, I said, I think the first time you do it, you wouldn't be bombarded. But by the second or third time, you could be just really hit in, you know, 20, 40, 68, 100, 20, like, oh, wow, I don't, I, like, I don't know. I don't know if we can handle that or not, what that would be. And then I thought, they have a sign up in Lexington. What, you know, that, that could be, I don't know. I thought, well, I wonder if they have an inside track, like somebody in the congregation works for like some, you know, company like, you know, that could have an inside track on that because it, I just thought, I thought that's scary right there. And I, you know, I had been like working on this. It, we, the timing was all wrong for this. So I don't guess it's going to happen this year. I'm a little sad over it because I didn't like, whenever I found out about this idea, it was too late to get to, uh, needed to take it to the men and just the timing just didn't work out at all and being able to do it. But <clears throat> at a community event, a congregation that, uh, in, in in one way or another, through Kaova, we're actually helping to support that a little bit. In Huntington, West Virginia, they had set up. They had a community event, and they set up a diaper changing station. And they, all they were doing is they had some tables in there and had a little shelter set up. And you know, basically, they let the moms come in or dads come in and change diapers. They didn't change the diapers for them. They just set up a place for them to change. And they probably did have some diapers on hand there for them. But I thought, you know, I thought that was such a good idea and, and such a you know, neat way to be involved in community and just spread the love of Christ. And I thought, I like that idea. But you know, timing didn't work out because for us, it's simple. You know, events in Flemingsburg, court day, that, that's about it. And then court day is just round in the corner. I think it's like this coming weekend and, and uh, stuff. So it, it didn't work out, but I thought, you know, dollars wise, I try to think of things, you know, we can, and I was like, how, how much can a few diapers cost? Well, I know, I know if you're mom, diapers can cost a lot. You guys will potty train, potty train, come on, come on, go. But, uh, and I know that, I know they're expensive, but you know what I'm saying? Just for an event like that, you know, I mean, you're going to have just a certain amount of moms come in and I thought, wow, that would be neat. But you know, the, the church, Figuring out what's his, uh, is is uh, a evangelist. You know what? What can we do? You know, there's so many. We have not. We've been left with some some guidelines to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing those. And, and and guys, we we have we don't have all the details given in that. We just have what we're supposed to do. And you see a lot of creativity among the churches for what people do to evangelize and the way they do that. And guys, this morning, we're in the book of Acts, but we're not in the book of Acts this week. In fact, we're not in the book of Acts for the next few weeks because we're going to change subjects. It's around this time of year that we usually talk, it's harvest time. And guys, we, we take a look at the church and we take a look at our giving and stewardship. And during this time, I, I want, to, want you to think about a few things. First of all, I don't know if you realize it or not, but in America, in the United States of America, we have 94% of the wealth in the world is located here. We are the richest country in the world. We are more wealthy, let me put it like this, we are more wealthy than 94% of the rest of the world. That's where America falls. Now I want you to think about this too. And I tried to get statistics on this, and statistics on this are always a little shaky. But with over 200 million people in the United States, that claim to be Christian, it puts us up between the 
three and 85% mark of this nation is considered Christian, quote unquote. You understand what I'm saying? That's where we're at. Now, if you look, if you look at the largest nations, the largest Christian nations in the world, and you try to find which nation has more Christians than any other nation in the world, you're going to see the number one nation is the United States of America. Now, I'll admit there's some little island with a name I can't pronounce that have 50 people that live on it that 100% are Christians. They hit the 100% mark, but there's 50 of them. In numbers, we number over 200 million. Think about that. You know, this is something that could only happen in America, a country that was set apart, different from all the rest of the world, a country that has been God-fearing in the past. I'm not saying where we are today or where we're heading to, but still there's a lot of people in this country that still claim that they still claim God and they still claim Jesus. So let's just look at it like that. But I want you to understand this morning, first of all, I'm going to try to get a couple of points across, is where I'm going to start, is, is uh, you know, we, we all have, we are all stewards. We're all giving certain things that we are to take care of that God's give us, but it, it's not ours, and that's something that we have to understand as Christians. Now, it is God who richly blesses. Do you guys believe that this morning? Do you think you do it of your own, or do you think God has anything to do with anything you have? Now, let me just read a scripture. I want you to be turning over to Luke chapter 12, but I want to read a scripture to you that's not in Luke chapter 12. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The scripture I'm going to read is 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. It says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Think about that statement. It is God who richly supplies us with, God, with all things to enjoy. What we have, God has entrusted with us. Now, we could look at several verses about that, but this is a particular parable that Jesus tells. It's in Luke chapter 12. And if you go to chapter 12 and go down to verse 13, is where we're going to start at. Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide my family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you then he said to them beware and be on guard against every form of greed for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions now he starts this parable listen to this parable closely and he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. If you go back in that scripture, and I kind of have it outlined here, but if you'll start about in verse 17 and you'll start looking at the me, myself, and I's in that little section of scripture, you're going to find out that there is a confusion with this person right here because they think everything is theirs. And they're deciding what they're going to do with what's theirs. I'm going to do this. I'll build bigger barns. I'll store up my food. And then I'll go and I'll sit back and I'll eat, drink, and be merry. And God says, thou fool, your soul is going to be required of you this very night. Now, who's going to own what you have? 
Whenever we begin to think about what is ours and what's not ours, we need to realize what God has entrusted us with, not what we see as me, myself, and mine. Now, many people have worked hard to get what they got, and therefore, we get underneath the impression that God doesn't have anything to do with it. We're not, you know, God didn't go out and earn the money, therefore, it's not, not you know, but, but we need to come at this and understand that we are stewards, that God has entrusted us. Now, I'm going to change the subject, or you think I'm going to change the subject. It's not really changing the subject, but I think there's a few things that we need to develop in this. And one is about the church. I want you to understand that the church is what God has given us, and the church is the bride of Christ. If you will, go with me to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. This is up on top of Peter's confession. He says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it, or will not overcome of it. Now, Jesus says that he is going to build his church. It's Christ's church. I don't think that anybody in here would disagree that the church belongs to Christ. Now, let me try to explain. First of all, you know, we, we've usually we've got people that's just coming in. We've got people that uh, were raised in the church since they were small children. You know, people come from all different walks of life. Um, you know, we, we have, so not everybody completely understands. But New Life Church of Christ here in Flemingsburg is not a denomination. You know, and some think, well, there's all kinds of denominations out there. New Life Church of Christ is not a denomination. It is a non-denominational church. You might be like, well, what, what exactly is a non-denominational church? Well, we're, we're not a denomination. The plea of the church is that we all be one, that we don't be a denomination, and a denomination itself is a separation or a split. So New Life Church of Christ is not a denomination. We're non-denominational. Now... The head of the church is Christ. Nobody has trouble understanding that, right? Head of the church is Christ. Now the head of the local church here is the elders. The elders are the head of the church and the church is Christ. Now we don't have any system beyond what is here and what is in heaven. That's it. In other words, there's no group of churches that New Life is a part of, and we have not been separated out into, say, Kentucky. We are the Kentucky Churches of Christ. And the Kentucky Churches of Christ answer to a big church of Christ that's over top of all the churches in Kentucky. And the person who answers over top of the churches in Kentucky answers a part of the ones that are part of the United States, and the part of the United States answers across the world. We don't have anything like that. In other words, there's no superintendent. There's nothing that's set apart. There's, no, there, there's nothing beyond New Life Church of Christ, the elders, and Jesus as the head of the church. You need to understand that. Now, there's a reason that it's set up that way, and that's because if we look in Scripture, that's the way it's set up here. In other words, the churches weren't all grouped together and then they all had a head over them and they all had this person and that person and, and we got down to the local body and the authority, the authority here rests with the elders and Jesus Christ as the head of the church. Everybody understands that, right? There is no others. Now what that means and why would Jesus set up his church like that? If you go and look at the seven churches in Asia found in the book of Revelation, you'll find out that not every church was doing what they needed to be doing. And Jesus called those churches to repent. They are independent of one another. In other words, you know, it is up to us to look at God's word, to study from God's word, and see what the New Testament church is doing, and to do that. Now guys, in thinking about that and realizing how the church is set up, 
I want you to go over to Acts in chapter 14 and verse 23. It says, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, fast, fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The church had elders. So we want to have elders. So these elders here were appointed at the time here we're looking at Paul and Barnabas. They're going around to the churches. They're appointing elders. The church has got elders. The church is the bride of Christ. Now, I, I want you to think about this. The church is the only place that the Lord's Supper is found. Now, you think about this for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, if you go there with me. Now, I know we're, you've got to keep the eldership in mind. You've got to keep the church in mind as the bride of Christ. But now we're looking into the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 18. It says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may be evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Follow the whole passage through, and what you're going to find out is the church was coming together. To, the, the Lord's Supper was the central part of why they came together, guys. You're going to find that out, and Paul is going to be so clear about it. He says, understand that when you come together as a church, and then he goes on, just follow the passage there, then for when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. It was the central part of it. The Lord's Supper is found in the church. Now, think about this. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says not forsaking our own assembling together. It doesn't say the assembly. Not forsaking the assembly. It doesn't say that. It says not forsaking the assembling with an ing of ourselves together. They were assembling for a purpose. What was the purpose that they were assembling? Go back and look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 10. You'll find out that Paul clearly states that the reason they're coming together is for the Lord's Supper. This is what the church came together for, for the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper is found in the church. Jesus only partakes of the Lord's Supper with the church. Think about this. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, Jesus said, By saying to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine... From now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Guys, think about what he said in Matthew chapter 16. Remember he said that about the church and the gates of Hades will not prevail? And then he says, Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. The kingdom and the church, guys. You have been translated out of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. Whose kingdom is it? It's Jesus' kingdom. When's the kingdom? It's now. We are right here in the midst of the kingdom. Right now. And you're also, whose bride is it? It's the church. I will build my church, my kingdom. Understand, the church and the kingdom are the same thing, guys. And he says that he will not partake it until he partakes it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When we're here, Christ is here. And he is part of this partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, to my knowledge, that can only be done within the church. And understand the church. You've got to think about that word, guys. The elders guard the church. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves, talking to the elders, and for all the flock. Who's the flock? You like being a flock? Like being a sheep? 
Sheep's, yeah, there, there's been this picture that's aired of this sheep. What's his name? Shrek? Shrek the sheep? Shrek the sheep has been showing up in pictures lately. Shrek the sheep is a sheep that hid out in a cave for seven years. He was lost for seven years. So Shrek didn't get a haircut for seven years. Do you know what Shrek looks like when you don't get a haircut for seven years? That's what Shrek looks like. Because he hid out in a cave for seven years. He wasn't part of the rest of the flock. The flock, the shepherd takes care of the sheep, right? They, you know, I don't even think Shrek could see. You know, he was like, he had to be going around like, boy, this is really dark in here. That's kind of what it is whenever we leave the flock, isn't it? And we do it on our own. We're not properly taken care of. It says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Think about that, guys. To shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. I hope this morning that you can see the church is real and elders are real. And this church is Christ's church. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't believe that New Life Church of Christ is Christ's church, then I would go to some place where you thought it was. I wouldn't waste another day, another moment here if I didn't think that this was the Lord's church. Now, I'm just as serious with you as I can be. I believe today that this is the Lord's church. I believe that this is the church that he died for. I believe that this is the church his blood was shed for. I believe this is the church that God raised him from the dead for. And I'm a part of that church. And I hope today you're a part of that church and you're serious about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're with me and you believe that this is the Lord's church and you believe that things are as they should be and we work very hard on those, we need to study the word diligently to see that they are, then I want you to think about something. Go with John me to chapter... Go with John to me. Go with, to the book of John, to chapter 12. Sometimes words don't come out like you want them to. Jesus, therefore, this is verse 1, chapter 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they had made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of Pernard, of Pernard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Judas complained that the money was wasted and could have been given to the poor. Now, I know it doesn't say this in this chapter, but the disciples joined in. I am not... 50% sure that the disciples joined in. I am 100% sure that the disciples joined in in what Judas was saying because in Matthew chapter 26, verse 8, it says they joined in. It says, but the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, why this waste? So here we have Jesus. We have perfume that is worth, according to the estimates I've got, about 11 months' wages, near a year's wages. And Judas evidently is the first one who speaks up and he says, why wasn't this given to the poor? Why wasn't this used? This is 300 denarii worth that could have been gotten. We could have given this to the poor. Then the disciples join in. Why this waste? Now, Jesus is going to have something to say about this, but I want you to understand something. Judas, who everybody chose to listen to, you see, they were stopped listening to Jesus, they were stopped following Jesus, and they were starting to follow Judas. Seemed like he had the answers here at the time. Now, Judas was a thief. I know he was a thief. Because in verse 6, it says he was a thief. Read with me. 
Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer from what was in it. Judas was a thief. He was stealing from the money box. You think about this for a minute. Now the rest of the disciples join in with him. They're like, yeah, why this waste? Look at this lady. She's wasting all this. Judas is a thief. He takes care of the money box. Did Jesus know who was going to crucify him? Oh, we could debate that. We could say, well, I don't know if Jesus knew or not. Well, you know, if we look in the Bible, we're going to find out Jesus knew exactly who was going to deny him. Did Jesus sometimes know what somebody was thinking before they ever said it? He did, didn't he? You think Jesus knew Judas was stealing from the money box? I think Jesus knew Judas was stealing from the money box. Now Jesus told them in verse 7 and 8, he said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Jesus, knowingly, Judas was stealing from the money bag. People were following Jesus in the thousands, guys. They were coming to him, and by John chapter 6, he had a massive crowd that numbered over 5,000 in men, not including women and children. No doubt, some of the money that was going in the money box was coming from those people. And there it is, Jesus, knowing good and well that we have a thief in the money box is letting those good people put their money in and their money is being stolen by Judas. But it went on anyway. But Jesus doesn't know what he's doing, right? Some didn't understand the waste. Let me give you some things. Now, Arnold Linda, this is absolutely positively nothing to do with you guys, okay? All right. So don't get, don't get, don't get worried here. A treasure, a treasure at the Orange County, Orange County Church is accused of embezzling more than $110,000. The prosecutors allege, I can't even pronounce the name, stole the money while serving as an interim treasurer at the first Salome Christian Congregational Church in Santa Ana. $110,000. Don't, don't have a clue what that is. Gatlin, Tennessee. Anybody ever been to Gatlin, Tennessee? No, no. Gatlin. Gatlin, Tennessee. I don't know where it is. So you, you know, okay, we got one here at least knows where Gatlin, Tennessee is. A middle Tennessee church that weathered nearly 200 years of history is concerned about the immediate future and years to come. It is all because one of their own, their treasure... Members of the treasury stole more than $160,000 from the funds of Douglas Chapel United Methodist Church in Gatlin. Here's another one. A church treasurer who plundered 70,000, I think this is pounds from two churches, to fuel his stamp addiction. A, a, a stamp addiction. I guess he collected stamps. Has paid money back after selling valuables collected. He was jailed over the scandal. Let me give you one more. There's actually, I've got a volunteer treasurer who stole 54000 from a small Elmhurst church while urging the congregational members to donate money. He was sentenced Friday for three years in prison. Last one. The treasurer of the Bethpage Church stole $35,000 from the, from the congregation's offerings, using the money for gas, fast food, and at least one mortgage payment. Nassau County District Attorney Kathleen Rice said Friday, Rice said that from June 2008 to May 2011, Camel stole roughly $35,000 from the East Meadow Church of Christ. 
Happens everywhere. Not uncommon. Not uncommon. Think of all that that has happened. Guys, you've got to know within all this, we live in an insecure world with insecure people that are unpredictable. Do you guys believe that? I can tell you horror story after horror story of preachers. It's easy with preachers because they, they boy, horror stories come right and left. Guys, I can tell you those who everybody thought was honest that turned out to be dishonest and didn't even come close to what people thought they were. And I can tell you the elders who turned out was having an affair with the deacon's wife. There's all kinds of these stories that float around. It's people that we're dealing with, people that are supposed to be serving Christ, but we have to understand it's not ours and it's his church. The church is the only organization And guys, I ask you this. Can the church really be an organization if it's the bride of Christ? Is there any organization that's alive? Is there any organization that could be the bride of Christ? The bride of Christ is living and active, isn't it? Think about it. The church is the only thing on earth that God has ever recognized that belonged to Him. Think about it. Are you a part of that church? The elders decide how the money's used. Now, guys, I'm not going to make, I'm not intending to make anybody mad in here, but I want you to think. Coba is not the church. Person to persons, ministries is not the church. Sugarloaf Christian Camp is not the church. Lifeline Ministries is not the church. TNT is not the church. I know none of those are the church because not a one of them are assembling on the Lord's Day to serve the Lord's Supper today. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying here. Not a one of them have elders, but the church has eldership. This is the God-ordained, set-apart church of Christ. It's his church. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, so do you also on the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections have to be made when I come. This morning, we're going to do an invitation. Jesus, he's coming back for the church. You realize that? the church. Don't you want to be a part of his church? Guys, he loved the church. He died for the church. God sent him to die for the church. Do you love his church? Do you want to be a part of that church? I want to be a part of that family of God, that one that he has set apart, that one that has been ordained, that has been put apart to share the gospel with the whole world. I want to be a part of that church. You can do that this morning. You can really make Christ Lord and King and Christ. If you'll believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and with the statistics on of America, I believe that everyone in here, I I really do, I believe you guys believe that. But this morning, it's time that you turn your life over to him and you stop being the head of that and let Christ be the head of that. Stop the I, me, and my and go to Christ for all the answers. This morning, if you'll you'll do that, if you want to change where you are today and and just to to completely change that, if you'll confess that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and God raised him from the dead. If you'll confess that, repent of those sins. Have a change of heart and a change of attitude about things. Hillary Underwood once told me that's the hardest thing. That's the reason that so few people end up coming to Christ. They don't want to repent, don't want to turn away. They want to keep doing what they're doing. If you'll repent of those, then won't you come this morning and be baptized for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit? I'd like to see somebody baptized into Christ today. I'd like to know that angels are rejoicing in heaven today. If you have a decision, won't you come and stand and sing?